So right now, um, and, and actually a couple of weeks ago, you could do radishes, um, mustard greens, lettuce. There are a bunch of Asian greens that do really well on the shoulder seasons. Um, and even kale transplants, you could, you could have planted a couple of weeks ago and you still can. Um, so if you're direct seeding something, it is really helpful to measure the soil temperature and then to look at the optimum range for what you're planting. A lot of things have a really wide germination range. Like it might be anything from 45 to 75 degrees or 80 degrees, but um, it's important to look at the optimum because there's no point in putting things in that are just going to hang out and have a hard time germinating and not all of them will do it. So we all have this urge to start, get going, <laughs> but it's really important to put things in at the appropriate time. So really looking for those vigorous early crops in April and then waiting until later in May. I like to wait until at least the second week, usually the third week in May to put in tomatoes, peppers, especially eggplant, which is very cold sensitive. They won't die necessarily if you pick them earlier, but if they experience a lot of temperatures in the 40s, they never really fruit as well. Um, it can lead to some, some various problems with fruiting and more disease susceptibility later in their lives. So you wanna give them like a nice strong foundation by putting them out when they're happy and not having them experience a lot of stress early on. Um, but that's okay because there's so many great cold crops to use. And another thing that can be great to incorporate in linking this season are perennials. So I saw, Oh, you don't have to go over there now. You probably know what it looks like, but there's everything you can take a look. There's a huge, beautiful rhubarb next to those raspberries in the back. So rhubarb, asparagus, chives, a few different herbs. Tarragon is up now. Even my lemon balm and mint are up now. So if you have perennial herbs, you can kind of get an earlier start because they're already established and they can, as soon as the conditions are right, they'll start coming up. And perennial veggies too. Um, that's a nice way to expand and you know lengthen your season and, and increase your early season harvest. While we're talking about season extension, actually my favorite way to do that is my cold frame. If you have enough space, a cold frame isn't necessarily going to fit in every small garden. If you just have a four by eight bed or something, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, but they can come in various sizes and you can build one or you can buy a kit or you can buy one, uh, whatever works for your, your level of handiness. Um, but they can be really simple, just four pieces of wood and some kind of window. Mine is a French door, so it's pretty big. Um, and it has a little thing that you can use to prop it open. And I planted spinach in September last year. I harvested it way into December. I stopped for a couple of months and then as early as March, we had beautiful lush spinach by mid-March coming up in there, even early March this year. Um, and there's other things for winter as well. Um, this Asian which is really delicious. It's big, so you need a taller cold frame. Duna overwinters really well. And I love spring tonic. Um, just a side note, it's not gardening, but just a side note, there's also a lot of forage in the early spring. So I found it was a really nice day in the line. We didn't get those hot early temperatures that make it get bitter. So now that it's flowering, it's a little bitter for most people's taste, but until now, it's been make a really nice salad. So my neighbor's kids will eat them, so I know they're not too bitter. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of other greens coming up, chickweed and violet greens you can eat and violet flowers. So just a side note, it's, you can explore it in another workshop, but there's a lot you can do to increase your palate in the spring with foraging too. Um, so we talked about overwintering in a cold frame. If you don't have a cold frame, um, there's some varieties of spinach that will just overwinter most years. So there's one that I love, the one that I did grow in my cold frame, I've also grown it just out. And especially if there's snow cover, so it helps protect things. But even if there's not, I've had it do pretty well overwintering on its own. You won't get it as late and as early, but it's still a nice April treat. Um, and that's called Giant Winter. That's my favorite. Um, it is exactly what it says it is. It's got big, lovely leaves and it survives a lot of cold. Um, and there are other crops that do that pretty well too. There's kales, the Siberian kale specifically, like White Russian and Red Russian are really uh, pretty resilient. So they're biennials, so by the, by, they're going to start going to seed and you won't get big leaves the second year. Um, but the second spring, you can get a lot of nice leaves off of them. Um, and you can have them grow pretty late into fall without any protection at all. Um, and if you do want to protect if you don't want to do something that's a little easier to disassemble and doesn't take up as much space, because storing the cold frame off season can be a little bit of a challenge in the city too. Um, 
a, a structure made of fabric growth cover and hoops is a great way to, um, you can use nine gauge wire and Johnny Seeds also sells, um, they're called pick hoops. So if you don't want to find the wire, which you have to really check, just buy to find it and cut it and everything. You can just get these pick hoops. I think that we're selling them at City Natives. They may be out of stock. So, um, uh, Crystal, if you want to put the City Natives link in at some point, that would be great. We have a lot of the crops I'm talking about and also some garden supplies that might be helpful. But anyway, these are um, little wire hoops that are flexible, really easy to use, and they store, you know, they take up hardly any room to store. Uh, and then you can, you know, roll some fabric um, row cover over it and lay down the sides, and you've got a nice little warm tunnel. It's not as warm as a cold frame and it won't survive the winter very well because if it snows on it, it tends to rip or get weighed down. Um, but in the off season, you know, in the shoulder seasons, it really does provide a few degrees of frost, frost protection, which is a lot. Um, one more word on season extension. Well, maybe it's gonna be one more word, but one more I'm thinking of right now. Um, mulch actually works to insulate the soil. So if you are trying to get the garden going early in the spring, I very much recommend having some kind of mulch like hay or straw, um, not a weedy hay, but salt marsh hay, or my favorite is straw or leaves, shredded leaves, um, over the winter and during the gardening season. But um, when you're getting started in the spring, if you want to warm up the soil, it's smart to move that mulch aside and let it warm up. It's really, you can see on a nice sunny day like today, the soil's getting a lot warmer. And we don't really only care about the temperature in the top couple of degrees, that's or top couple of inches because that's where your seeds are germinating and where your seedlings are living for the first you know, few weeks of their lives. Um, so moving aside the mulch will let that soil warm up. Uh, and then definitely putting it back once your plants are established to help insulate the soil um, from a lot of temperature changes, which aren't good for the soil food web, um, and to keep down weeds and keep in moisture. And that's one of the ways I think that we can really take care of our gardens when we're thinking about oh well, we're trying to plant early and late and lots and lots of vegetables throughout the season we definitely want to take care of soil so adding organic matter is key compost is great for that and mulch especially leaves eventually will break down um, and um, break down and add organic matter to the soil So a brief word on organic matter, it's not the subject here, but I can't help talking about it just a little bit to say that um, there's a whole ecosystem in the soil that we, most of which we can't see, which is beneficial fungi and bacteria. There's also some somewhat larger organisms. Um, there's lots going on in there. And the engine that feeds all of that and the real like basis for that life is organic matter. So that's why I love leaves because they break down pretty readily and they feed the soil. And that's, you know, here in New England, that's what we have is normally is leaf litter covering our, our healthy ecosystems, um, at least our forest ones. And um, compost is good for that. You know, it can be compost you make yourself, it can be compost you bring in. Um, it's compost, people often think of it as a fertilizer, but really it's more of an amendment that feeds the whole ecosystem. It's not super high in nitrogen um, generally, but it is high in organic matter. And that will help your soil retain moisture better, retain nutrients better, and feed your plants. So it's a win win. Um, and mulch is a great way to keep that organic matter from, from disappearing and to replenish it throughout the season and throughout the winter. Um, but I won't get too distracted. I can talk about mulch for a long time. So <laughs> any of my master of gardener students know, so we'll move on. Um, so we've talked about different ways of season extension. I wanna mention that crop selection is pretty important for this too. So I talked about that um, giant winter spinach that I love, but there are also um, a lot of other crops that do well in the early season. And even let's say you love lettuce and you wanna grow lettuce all year. Um, you can find different lettuces that are good for the spring and the fall and the ones that actually can handle the heat because a lot of lettuce can't really tolerate the heat. Um, so paying attention to those variety selections is important. And that's where I think ordering your seeds rather than just purchasing them. Um, and also, you know, going to, I have a slight self-interest in saying this, but not just the trustees nursery, but any local farm that knows what they're doing, especially a local organic farm that grows seedlings is a great place to get things that are well adapted to our climate. They're gonna be selling them at the appropriate time for planting. And they won't be plants that have come up, you know, from 
Georgia or North Carolina, a lot of times with fungal diseases on them and a lot of times not really well adapted for our climate. So I really recommend looking for good Northeast seed companies and good local seedlings if you're not growing your own. Um, and then paying attention to what does well when, even there's cabbages that are best for spring and best for fall and broccoli that's best for spring and best for fall. So it's good to pay attention to all of that. Season extension in the spring here, really on both ends, it's, it's getting harder because our weather is a little, you know, as we know, climate change is making it unpredictable and sometimes the temperatures spike in the spring, and sometimes it's too hot in the fall to get anything established. But in general, at least trying to find things that are adapted for our climate um, is good. And this year has actually been like a pretty nice spring. I think it's been pretty predictable so far. It's a little dry, but lately we're getting more rain and this week we're getting more rain, so hopefully we'll get out of that cycle. Um, and it hasn't been, you know, these weird 80 degree days. So those can be really confusing to pull the weather crops. Um, there's also even carrots. There are ones that are better suited to this germinating in the spring, ones that are better suited to germinating, you know, that can handle the heat a little bit. So paying attention to that is good. If you're having trouble getting lettuce or spinach to, to do well in the summer, it's not you, it's them. Um, they, they don't like to germinate in the heat. They actually have heat dormancy when soil temperatures are over 80 degrees, they just stop germinating because they know it's not the right growing conditions for them. Um, so there are these summer lettuces and certain varieties of spinach that are better for that, but in general, you might want to switch to a more flexible green. A lot of the Asian greens like Kizuna, Tatsoi can grow both in, in just a nice wide range of temperatures. So I really like that for that. I've been talking a lot. I want to pause and see if there are any questions in the chat or here. Um, do we have it? Do you have to dig in the compost or can you top dress? You can definitely top dress it. So I, I did a whole workshop a couple weeks ago about no-till. I'm a real fan of just adding organic matter and not disturbing the soil. Once your soil is, you know, if, if once your bed is established, um, the more you turn the soil, the more you unearth weed, weed seeds, expose right. them to light and they yeah. germinate. So that's that's what that. I do. And, and, but I was like, am I missing out? Is this your plot? No, it's over there with the raspberries. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, yeah, I absolutely, I, in case you didn't hear everyone, the question was, can you top dress the compost, meaning just apply a layer on top or do you have to work it in? And I agree that top dressing is great. I think when you are first establishing a bed, you should work some compost into it, make sure you get all the grass roots out, make sure it's nice and aerated. And after that, if you follow some simple practices, so look at how this construction has um, stones in here. That this means they know where to walk. And they're not gonna walk the garden. So there's been a real source of compaction in here, which is really important. If you're not compacting your soil, if you're protecting it with mulch to keep the rain and weather from compacting it and keeping it you know, nice and, and loose. Um, and I guess those are the main things. If you're not doing those things, um, you don't have to dig it up every year. Um, so it's much better to just remove weeds individually or with a hoe that doesn't go too deep and not just always be turning the soil. And I think because that I found when I turned the soil uh, every year, I was having terrific weeds. Mm -hmm. And I stopped doing that. And I have a few and mm -hmm. I have to dig them up, but it's nothing like it was before. Absolutely. I'm so, really you're like a, an audience plant. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> because I totally agree. And sometimes I people being lazy, but I, and one side, and then. <laughs> Actually, the, the woman who established this like 30 something years ago, she used to scold me for not like, you know, deep digging in herself, well, having these perfectly clean oh, yeah. plots. And I'm like, just leave me alone. <laughs> I mean, okay, it looks beautiful. I think we all have this thing, freshly turned soil. When you because first I get all kinds of poppies and um, uh, other spring, you know, I just, all kinds of things grow in there. And if I can recognize them, mm -hmm and not weed them out, then I, you know, I used to get forget me nice and all kinds of stuff. And then I'd plant my other stuff around it. So <laughs> it was always a, like a, a improvisational interaction with my plot and, and with the seeds that had been left over. Mm -hmm. The poppies were the best. Last year, the rabbits ate them all, but usually I have about 100. <laughs> Just, anyway. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's really big question from the chat. Um, you know, if you're letting flowers or herbs, herbs will do a lot of basil and tulsi. Don't need to do that in my garden. Dill, too much dill. I have to yeah, keep yes. it out. But it's nice if you don't turn the, the soil over early in spring and you just kind of wait to see what happens and then clear where you need to, um, you know, pull out the volunteer plants that you don't want. But you can, you can really gain a lot. I think that's 
a great point. Um, there's a lot, I won't get too into it, but there's a lot of things that tillage does to your soil. Besides cleaning up weed seeds, it breaks up the soil structure so that it's harder for your soil to hold on to nutrients and to hold on to water. Um, it burns through the organic matter. It really activates the certain kind of bacteria that eat a lot of organic matter. And we want a more balanced ecosystem. Um, so you don't want as much aerobic bacteria sort of taking over. And also fungi are really important to the health of your soil. Um, and the more that you, you disturb the soil, the less chance they have to establish. They really like calm, <laughs> not too much oxygen, not too much disturbance. So there's a lot of reasons to you know, get a nice garden established and then just top dress mulch and not dig too much. You can loosen the soil. You might need to loosen it for seeds. And a great way to do that is just take a spade and fork, put it into the ground and lift a little bit, but don't flip everything and turn it over. That, and you can also use what's called a broad fork, which is just a bigger version of that. I mean, it's probably not necessary in a small garden if you're a lot of permaculture folks who are trying to aerate larger um, swaths, larger gardens or small farms which you use those broad forks. Um, and this is, you know, it's a lot of us grew up seeing the people we knew who gardened or ourselves learning to just turn everything every spring that was part of the process but it's really uh, i think getting very widely understood of a lot of small farmers especially are adopting and larger farmers are adopting no-till practices and, and discovering they have fewer weeds they have less water they need to add which is really important for summer droughts that we have and then that they have healthier soil and crops so it is relevant to this high yield thing because you can't talk about high yield without talking about soil care. You really want to be taking care of your soil. Um, you might still need to add nitrogen of some kind. Um, you can also top dress it. So if you don't have like a high nitrogen compost, organic matter is great, um, but it tends to be as leaves, all of that tend to be high in carbon. So you want to make sure that you're also providing enough nitrogen for your soils because that balance between nitrogen and carbon is important. So if your plants don't seem to be growing well, you could introduce something like coffee grounds, dehydrated chicken manure, fish emulsion as needed. Not everything needs it. Most of the salad greens and definitely your beans and peas don't need much fertilization. But the real heavy hitters, the ones that spend a lot of energy fruiting like tomatoes, cucumbers, melons, all of those might benefit from some nitrogen at the time of planting and maybe um, you know a couple weeks in as they get established. And then if it's really helpful to test your soil, um, UMass is open, their soil lab is open again. It's pretty busy this time of year, but whenever you spend it in, it's useful. So if you go to the UMass um, I think if you just search UMass soil tests, they have pretty nice instructions on how to take a good sample. And then on how, once you get your sample back, um, they give you good instructions on, you know, this is optimum, this is low, whatever. Most of our urban soils are like too high in everything, um, but it's good to look at the balance and make sure that your, you know, your phosphorus and potassium levels are reasonable because that's what helps with root growth, flowering, and fruiting. Nitrogen just helps with root and vegetative growth. Um, as a side note, a simple thing that I often use is this organic tomato tone. I'll just put a spoonful into the hole with the tomato and mix it up with the soil. You want to make sure you don't burn your plants. So mix the fertilizer in well and don't overdo it. It's sometimes people think, oh, it's just more is better, but too much fertilizer leads to too much lush growth. It attracts pests. It, it's a good medium for diseases and it can um, result in a lot of food growth and not a lot of fruit. So it's really nice to every couple of years to test your soil. Then you have this basis for what you're doing instead of just adding stuff willy-nilly. Um, you also, as you get to know gardening, might be able to look at your plants and, and ascertain that they're not getting enough of a certain thing, but that's a little bit harder. Um, do you think this is a good time to stop for audience questions? Oh, absolutely. Yes, we didn't do that. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, Nicole, can you hear me? Okay, so I think um, we have a question. What specific tomato fertilizer did you mention? Oh yeah, the one that I like is just because it's easy, it seems to work well, it's called tomato tone and they have an organic version. There's also vegetable tone. I think you can use that more broadly. They're almost interchangeable. They have like bone meal and dehydrated chicken manure and blood meal. It's just like a bunch of organic fertilizers that are pretty well balanced. Um. Yeah, and then I think there was also a question about, uh, can you buy Asian green seeds anywhere in Boston, Chinatown? And Crystal responded, oh, Fedco and Seedville. Yeah, I mm -hmm. actually don't know where you can get them locally. I would imagine there would be a hardware store or 
something in Chinatown. It's a great question, but I don't know. I have always, I order all my seeds, so I ordered them. Um, we have some, we have some uh, as seedlings. If you haven't ordered seeds and you wanna um, get seedlings, we have some beside different types of like full and green and baby and adult um, pop choice. Which those are a great a great crop for extending the season because if you plant if you start them indoors and then you plant them or buy them whatever if you plant them four weeks later you can at, at most you can harvest a nice little head of baby pop choy and then you still have time to plant a warm weather crop and you can do the same in the fall. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question about Chinatown. I don't know. Yeah, someone says that um, the H Mart in Cambridge, so by Central, has oh, seeds. Oh, nice. Um, and then also want to confirm, uh, I think you were talking about a spinach variety that's winter friendly. So Crystal got giant noble spinach, but is that? Um, right so one? the one there, that is a good variety, but I don't, I'm not actually sure how well it overwinters. The one that I was talking about is called giant winter, okay. which may be like a strain of the giant noble that was bred for, um, for winter. I don't think it's a hybrid though. So yeah, giant winter. Yeah, and I think um, there's also like one question when you were um, talking with the community garden member about who was talking about observational interaction with the plot. Mm -hmm. um, for, you can yeah, we can, um, maybe at the, at the end, we can <laughs> go over to her plot and have her talk about that a little more because I think it's interesting. Oh. Are we caught up? Um, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, we're having, I think, a technical issue where when people ask questions out loud, we can't hear it on the device. So, yes. so we'll, I'll try to remember to repeat that. Yeah, so I'll uh, yeah, also like try to read out of the chat then. Okay, um, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, another thing I wanted to talk about was interplanting, which is, so this is a little bit different than companion planting, which is where you're like, this plant and this plant like to grow together because of some hard to understand sometimes reason, you know, carrots love tomatoes or whatever. And I'm not saying there's nothing to any of that, but a lot of, there's kind of a lot of lore around that that doesn't have a, a really solid um, or well understood reasoning and scientific backing. So what I like to think about is stuff that we can really see for what plants grow well. So if you plant, um, there's a few different ways that you can pair things. If they have different sizes or different shapes, um, that can work well. So an example there is, let's say you have scallions or onions that really don't make a lot of above ground growth. They grow straight up. They pair really nicely with something like Swiss chard um, or kale that has a big, you know, expansive growth habit on top. They don't really compete with each other very much. Um, so that kind of, that's one sort of pairing. Then another is about time. So you can do like radishes or salad mix. Um, one of my very favorites is to transplant um, tomatoes and lettuce at the same time. So the tomatoes need so much space and I always feel it in a small garden plot, it really hurts to leave two feet between plants. Um, but if you're growing full size heirloom to make indeterminate vining tomatoes, you kind of need to do that because they're gonna get huge. But in the meantime, you can have plant a little head lettuce, um, cut it after four or five weeks. And by that point, you know, it hasn't minded a little bit of shade from the tomatoes. It probably actually liked it. Um, and then the tomatoes are starting to really need that space. So that's an example where time is the, is the difference that you're working off of. And I mentioned radishes. I love radishes. So it's really easy for me for intercropping. I'll just, I'll seed a row of radishes between a seed of a row of carrots, which are slow growing, or really a couple of them seeded between anything that's gonna take longer um, because they only take four weeks from seed to harvest, maybe five. Um, and, and here I'm not talking about daikon or any of the specialty radishes, which I love, but they take up more space and time. Like the little uh, Easter egg or French breakfast radishes, the small quick ones are fantastic to plant in the spring when you're transplanting. And then you can just, as long as you're careful when you pull them up, like especially if you have another root crop like carrots there, you don't, you have to kind of hold the soil, be careful so that you're not disturbing the, the slower growing crop. Uh, you can also do radishes and beets, that works well. Um, another example is light needs. So you might um, have a cucumber trellis and then you might plant arugula or mustard greens mix or salad mix in the shade of that because you have the cucumbers that need that sun and then you've got that um, cool weather crop that actually appreciates the shade as it gets into the hotter part of the season. Um, I don't know if anyone else has examples of things they like to plant together for that kind of reason. Feel free to share. 
I'm sure there are more examples. And, and it doesn't just have to be two crops. I've done a one that was really successful with um, planting charred transplants. And you could do this with kale too. It's kind of got the same growth habit and timing. Um, charred transplants, um, onion seedlings, which I planted in a little pumps to harvest the scallions, um, and radish seeds. And so I pulled out the radishes when they were ready and then I let the other two grow for a while and they really didn't eat each other very much. So that was like using a few of those different principles in one and it worked really well. Um, so interplanting I love, it's also known as intercropping, it's the same thing. You can look up all kinds of examples and you can just get creative. Maybe one word of caution is that sunflowers can suppress the growth of other plants. So be a little, and some, some species are more susceptible to that kind of suppression than others. So I've found that like, eggplant growing next to sunflowers really was not happy, but I've had other things like bees climbing up sunflowers and it's no problem. So there's a few plants that do that, but really not that many in the vegetable garden that suppress the growth of other plants, which is like a really great evolutionary tactic, but not great for the gardener. Um, and another thing, so I, I kind of was starting to hint at this, oh, look, like, this is perfect. Let's look at this. Um, we have a cool, couple of cool examples of trellises here. So vertical growing can be anything from, you know, a bamboo trellis like this. There's a number of tomato cages in the garden. Here's some, I'll know what those look like. I would say if you're growing full size, like heirloom tomatoes or cherry tomatoes, I don't find those cages just to be very helpful. Um, I like either a steak or like a homemade cage that you actually can buy. I think um, Gardner Supply Company and I'm sure other places have these more sturdy, big tomato cages. If you don't want to make something, I would go with those. Um, you can also plant tomatoes in a row and have steaks and just tie them, find the string between them. It sort of depends what fits well in your garden. Um, but vertical growing is a fantastic way to get more out of your space. Um, as you can see, there's space under here where, um, you know, in the early season, before it gets fully covered with cucumbers or beans or whatever you're growing here, you can have some cool weather crops growing. And if you want to see a really, some really inspiring examples of this, I recommend going to the Berkeley Garden. Um, it's on East Berkeley Street between uh, Tremont and Shawmut. Yep, take the whole block. Um, so in the South End, and it's like amazing. There are about 30% or so of the gardeners are Chinese gardeners who use these traditional techniques of, um, of making really awesome trellises, like to walk into the garden like it's a room. And then there's lots of cool weather crops underneath. Oh, another cool weather crop that does well with that, a lot of people grow um, allium families. So garlic, onions, um, chives, garlic chives, they do really well in that shaded space. But there's also a lot of greens. You see people with chrysanthemum, a lot of different greens, even daikon and radish under those trellises. Um, so I'm sure you can find a lot of inspiring examples online, but if you want to get out and take a walk. Although I, they did just have a bunch of uh, copper piping and stuff stolen, so they might be locked in the garden again right now, but usually there's someone there doing on the weekend. It's worth checking out. Um, but yeah, vertical growing is interesting because like I have a lot of space where I grow my fruiting crops, so I just let them grow um, on the ground, that my cucumbers and squashes. But if I had minimal space, it would definitely be worth trellising them. Um, and then you can get straighter fruit and you have less of a chance of having rotten fruit. So there's advantages to trellising. Each plant will actually produce less when trellised because when they're growing on the ground, they, they create little roots from their nodes, uh, adventitious roots, and that helps them get water and nutrients to the plants. Um, however, you get so much more in the space um, that you have if you use a trellis that it still ends up being worth it. Like you get more per square foot even if you get less per individual plant, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, cucumbers do really well that way, beans and, and peas. Um, the vining varieties need that. Um, some people do squashes and melons that way and you can, but you might need support. You might need to do the little trick with like a piece of t-shirt or nylon or some, some stretchy thing to help, to help the vines because if you've got a heavy fruit hanging off a vine like this, it can be hard. Um, and that's why uh, an A-frame like this can be really good for heavier crops versus just a straight up and down. Straight up and down is, is really fine for peas uh, and beans, but an A-frame is good for heavier stuff so that it's not quite so vertical. Anything else?
any questions about vertical gardening, trellising ideas? You can't see much is actually happening here, but you can see where it's going to happen. Um, you can do it with all kinds of materials. This person here has, it looks like a grapevine and they've got chicken wire behind it as a support. So wire, um, fencing, uh, you know, bamboo like this or found saplings, you know, if you find like down wood or if you're clearing land somewhere and you can get lots of little healthy saplings that can come out. I'm not recommending you cut down trees just for this, but as a side product. Um, I love electric metal conduit, which is like a half inch hollow um, pipe that is um, useful for a lot of things in the garden and is great for trellising because it doesn't rest. Um, you can cut it with a simple little like cheap pipe cutter. Sorry, that again. Um, it's called electric metal conduit. I like the half inch one. So you can. No, it, it's uh, metal. And it it's it doesn't rust and it has you can fix it together with just these elbows that you screw in. So even if you don't have any tools or like you're not gonna weld something, this is a pretty great way. And then you can take apart those elbows and lay it flat for storage. So it's pretty great, it lasts forever. I'm getting it to stay in the ground. If you don't have a raised bed, you need to like pound something in like rebar or something like that. Uh, make either a deep hole for it or something for it to slide onto because otherwise it doesn't get it's not pointed doesn't get enough purchase. But on a, a raised bed, it's really easy to just use clamps on the outside to secure it. Um, there's lots of good examples of that online if you're interested, but that's a great material. You don't have to invest in something like that, but if you do, you don't have to invest in anything else for a while. And I think it's like two or three bucks for a 10 foot piece, so it's, it's not crazy at all. Um, and they have it at you know hardware stores and stuff like that, uh, building supply stores. So yeah, that's my quick explanation of vertical gardening. Are there any more questions, Emily, that we should address? Um, I don't see questions in the chat, but if anyone has them, please feel free to send or Crystal um, please send them out. I think also the audio might be getting cut in and out of there. I think we're on Wi-Fi, but uh, yeah, we can repeat things, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Did. Yeah, sorry about that. Maybe um, at the end, I can just come closer and we can make sure we get the yeah. Zoom okay, people. Yeah, one more thing, technique I wanna talk about is um, relay planting or succession planting. So these are technically two different things. A relay is when you plant the same crop, like green beans or lettuce or carrots periodically throughout the season so that you have a full, a, a full season supply. So an example of that that I really like to do is, well, I do arugula for a lot of the season, but I also do um, cilantro because cilantro wants to bolt. Its growth habit is just to grow flower, go to seed, and it's supposed to just continuously do that. And when you try to just have like a cilantro plant or patch and keep it going, it's very frustrating. Every three or four weeks, I seed it because it's important. I'm Indian and I like to cook Mexican food also. So I use a lot of cilantro and um, just planting it every three or four weeks is a great example of a relay that lets you have a continuous supply. Some people do realize, but some farmers usually, I don't think gardeners usually need to do this, will do relays with um, zucchini and summer squash because it starts to kind of peter out if you're cooking it hard and it's producing a lot. So you can do that. Um, if you grow bush beans rather than full green beans, um, they tend to produce a concentrated set of fruit and then kind of peter out. So you can grow them three times during the warm part of the season if you want to have them all the time. Um, or you can just grow whole beans, which have a much uh, longer harvest window, less at one time. Um, that same principle, by the way, holds true for vining versus determinate tomatoes. So the tomatoes that stay small tend to have a concentrated fruit set and then kind of peter out. Um, so a great way to get a continuous supply of tomatoes is to grow some varieties with different days to maturity. If you pay attention to those when you're buying seed or seedlings, um, you can get some early tomatoes, some mid and some late. A lot of the heirlooms just are late, but there are, there's, there's a range. You have tomatoes that are ready in anything from 60 something days to 100 something days. So, and I wouldn't go over 100 as much because it just won't happen here. Yep, <laughs> it's New England and you're gonna end up with a lot of green tomatoes in a, in a grocery bag trying to ripen them, which is <laughs> you know not as good as fine ripened. Um, but yeah, that's another example where you can look at uh, Days maturity at variety selection to help you have a good long season. 
Um, Isn't there like cilantro? Like how much space do you need when you're receiving? Um, that's a really good question. So I think we have a tendency to think like it's a little herb. You can grow it really close together, but it will bolt more quickly if it doesn't have space. So I often will seed it. I'm usually using safe seed. I don't know how good the germination is going to be. So I'll seed it sprinkle it in a patch so that there's about a half inch between plants but as it grows i'll thin it to eat instead of picking it okay so um and then i think if you really want to have it get big you want to have like four inches between plants and i i think that's actually an important point i'm going a little off topic but the idea of patches versus rows so rows were really developed for like tractors or horses some you know when that's the way you need to cultivate things and weed them um, but if you're just growing a small garden, um, sprinkling seeds is a really great way to grow a lot of things. And even if you're not, even if you're transplanting, um, say you're growing lettuce, if you grow it in a grid pattern where you can kind of stagger it and make a patch of it versus a row, you can get much more in one place. So it's a little bit harder to weed maybe, but if you've just got a small garden and you're weeding by hand, it's totally doable. Um, so that's just a side note on um, planting style. Um, also, you can follow, you should still follow spacing guidelines and the intensive spacing guidelines. I can send that out in a follow up to all of you. Uh, I'll send out like the, the link to the recording and a couple of resources um, next week. But um, if you want to Google it yourself, intensive spacing guidelines are widely available. And they are um, basically the principle is if you could grow something four inches apart in row, why do you need the rows to be 18 inches apart? And oftentimes you don't. So um, you can grow in a grid pattern and grow things just four inches apart, which is really great for people with you know small urban plots. Um, on that note, okay, well we can go back to um, succession planting and relay planting. So we talked about things that you grow relays of. Now for successions, it's more like what we talked about before. You could grow radishes and um, mustard greens and things like that now, then you grow warm weather crops, and then again, you can grow those cool weather crops, most of them again. It can be a little challenging to get cool weather crops to germinate in like late August, early September, which is around the time when you want to be doing a lot of them. Um, I have one trick that works well for carrots or other slow germinating crops, which is to um, seed them, water well, and then mulch. And then just make sure you set yourself a reminder or whatever you need to do to take the mulch off after about a week before things germinate. And that keeps the soil really cool. I had fantastic like fall carrot germination, which I used to really struggle with. But it only works for slow germinating things. Something like a radish that comes up in a few days, it wouldn't make sense. Um, but radishes can germinate at any temperature, so it doesn't matter. But for lettuce and carrots, that can be an interesting approach. And spinach. Um, just maybe five days for those other crops because they're a little bit faster than than uh, carrots at germinating. Um, yeah, I think that's most of what I wanted to say. Do we have any more questions? Exactly. See that? Yeah. That's what I don't love about the cages. So, um, there's that condiment, one of the examples of the kind of thing that you can use is trails and vintage breakfast potatoes. So you can make a frame out of the conduit, and then you can hang strings or wire down from that. And if you want it to be taut, it can be helpful to, to tie them just to a wire or a string that you put along the bottom. If you use twine, you want to make sure that you're using a twine that isn't going to stretch too much so that like normal green garden twine really stretches and breaks pretty easily. Uh, so I, like a hemp twine or jute or never remember how to say it, sisal or sisal twine, that stuff is pretty durable. The nylon is too, but then you have this nasty thing that you have to throw in the landfill and it's hard to get it disentangled from your plants, whereas all those other things are compostable. Do you mind repeating the question, I think? Oh, I'm so here. sorry. She was, um, sorry, the question was um, how to deal with the fact that tomatoes want to grow for any crop that wants to grow much taller than a, than a cage. So that was one example I was giving of, of the conduit frame. Um, I don't, you also have, um, 
there are taller cages. So you can see in the corner there, those green ones, those can show up some more like burly tall tomato cages. So you could use something like that. And then the other thing, what farmers do, and this only makes sense for you if a row works in your garden spacing, um, is they have, um, you just use big uh, wooden stakes. You pound them in, it's really helpful to have the stake pounder tool to do that, uh, but you can do it with, you know, with a mallet if you're like standing on a bucket or if you're really tall. Um, and so you want to make sure it's really firmly in the ground. So get something that's uh, maybe at least six feet tall to start with because you're going to put a foot of it in the ground. Seven or eight is even better because then if, if a little bit of it rots off, you still have something following years. Um, and you pound those in and in a row and then you can weave, um, weave the twine around the tomatoes as they grow. That's if you want, it's, it's not an easy thing to talk about. It's probably an easier thing to see. So if you look up the Florida weave, that will give you an example of that. Um, so yeah, I, I like any of those methods. And some people will just do one steak and prune the tomato and tie it. If you only have a few, that works well too, if you don't have them in a row. But yeah, the cages I find at, at the very least stake the cage and then you have another support to use because the cages I find are just like not enough on their own. Um, I think we have one question in chat um, asking if we could see the plot where the gardener went with what appeared spontaneous. Absolutely. She actually is not here anymore, but let's go look at her plot. Okay. And we'll see if we can find some examples. But you can see, for example, um, we have this columbine. And probably it was originally planted in one place, and now it's here, here, here. here. Um, so this is a, a beautiful, it might be the native one. I, no, I don't think so. But it's anyway, a really nice um, early spring flower. Pollinators love it. So that's one thing that, you know, if she had just tilled everything early in the spring, that would have gotten tilled up. Um, it looks like there's clover established in the top base here. Mixed with some other ground covers. I think these are, I don't remember what these are. I think um, there's violets, there's mint coming up. There's a lot of stuff that uses itself around. Um, I mean, we have some perennials, of course, the peonies and some bulbs and some daiquiris, which look so nice. Um, <laughs> lots of tribes coming up. So yeah, and you can see over here that some fennel has seeded itself. It looks like some more of that columbine. Um, this looks like some kind of aster or goldenrod, which is a nice pollinator flower. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of coming up. Um, and I think what she was mentioning is that she would just, you know, want it. And it doesn't leave every volunteer that comes up. But once you see what's there, you can kind of decide what you want to keep and what you want to clear out so that you can plant something else. I think it's a nice notion to think of like, you're more having a, a dialogue and you're figuring out what really wants to grow in a place rather than coming in with this like, this is my idea and I will impose it on everything. And if you really want to grow the most possible food in a, in a plot, then this is not probably your approach. But if you're interested in seeing what happens, it can be a lot less work to grow things that pop up, you know, because they want to grow there. They've decided, they've realized the conditions are right for them. Not to anthropomorphize too much, but they come up because it, because they're going to do well there. So it makes some sense. Um, we were talking about perennial crops, here's some asparagus. It looks like they aren't picking this too hard, they probably get letting the crop get established. Um, so for asparagus, for the first couple of years, you don't harvest it too much, but, um, but here's some lovely shoots. And um, I just planted asparagus, I'm super excited. I mean, it's just starting to, to send up shoots. So we'll be waiting. Asparagus and, and a lot of perennial crops, it isn't like maybe the most, efficient for space you know this is gonna you're only gonna harvest this asparagus for um a few weeks maybe four weeks and then for the rest of the year and forever it's going to be taking up this space so the same thing is true with, say strawberries like you harvest them um for a few weeks they're delicious it's amazing but then you have to leave those plants there so there's a trade-off with perennial crops if you have minimal space they take a lot less work they just kind of come back you need people needed but that's it 
Um, but you do have to be willing to give over that space to them. So it's kind of a smart, like probably not a huge amount of food is going to grow on this edge anyway. I think this person has taken the approach of putting their perennials along the edge and then they probably do their garden veggies in the middle, which I think is smart. Um, you can see the chives, the oregano, they're already totally ready to start harvesting, which is pretty exciting in the spring <laughs> after a long winter grab food. <laughs> So yeah, there's a really lovely plot in here. As you can see, the raspberries are a big thing in this garden. It's really fun to come here in July. Uh, <laughs> we, we, they sometimes have potlucks. And there's always raspberries featured. Um, yeah, I think that's, oh, this is off topic, but I just feel like everyone should get to see this because it's the best compost bin in the community <laughs> garden. So look. <laughs> So this is, this is what's called hardware cloth, which is really great for excluding pests of all kinds. It's odd that it's called cloth, it is not, it's metal. It's half inch hardware cloth. Um, and then they put it together with some trash, which is like a wood that won't rot, a fake wood that won't rot. Uh, I don't recommend it for use in garden plots, but for a compost it can be really good. And then this comes apart. So you can open up the top, but I think you can also open up this side, right? One of the sides for easy turning. So, and, and they've added, they've got four bays here, I think. Yep. You can add to two of them probably because there's a lot of, like the waste at the beginning is very bulky, so it makes sense to have more space for adding. And then the way to turn is just to move it to another bin. I mean, you can take it out and put it back in, not just to move it to another bin. So, I guess everyone knows where they should be adding versus where they should be. Um, you know, I just love this one because it's actually rotted through, which is really hard to accomplish, but really important. And if you want it to be rotated, you've got to have the, this on the bottom also, not just on the sides. Okay. I think we have one question about how, about vining plants that get really long. So this person's um, cucumbers grew way out of the frames they got for them and so got out of control covered half the garden so how do you <laughs> deal with that yeah so it's a good question a lot i do see a lot of like kind of dinky looking products being sold just like the tomato cages there are also a lot of um you know cucumber trellises that are this tall or something that's just not going to cut it they need something taller i would say like the height of the thing we were standing at before which is about you know five feet or so is good the other thing you can do is you can train them a little bit. You don't have to rely on them to know where to go. If they're crawling on the ground and you don't want them to, you can bring them up towards, you know, lean them onto the trellis. You can even use the string to, to loosely secure a bunch of vines, not tying the actual vine, but creating something that holds them up against the trellis is a good idea. Um, and then worst comes to worst, you can always prune them. If you don't want to make a lot of cuts in cucumbers because it's a place where diseases can get in, but if they're just too many for the space that you have. Another thing is just don't overplant. So make sure you're not planting more than one every 16 inches or so. If you're growing on a small trellis, you can maybe get one every foot, but you wouldn't want too many yeah. crowded together. I think you are also a little bit far to catch the whole part about the compost bin. So maybe if you oh, could, sure. like, maybe yeah. summarize it. Yeah, basically, parts. I just love this compost bin because it uses this hardware cloth to cover it. It has four bins, so there's two bins to add stuff into, and then um, and then as you move stuff along, um, it gets aerated and continues on its way to compost. If you just have one pile that you're always adding to, your compost can never finish. <laughs> so this is a good system. Um, and then it's it's smart because you can flip up, it's hinged, so you can flip up the cover to add to it. But it also has on the front here, instead of the hardware cloth, it has something that can actually, if you need, be taken. Actually, I don't think that's true. This doesn't look like you can take it out. No, you can't. You can't take out the board. Okay, yeah. I thought so. I thought that was interesting. So you can take out these boards. Uh, oh yeah, they're just slid in. Yeah. Okay, so that these boards just kind of stack on each other. And you can take them out so that you can easily get in there because if you just have to get in from the top, you're never going to turn the file. That's great. A key with compost is making it rodent proof and then making it easy to turn. Those are like the two things that will make you actually have compost successfully. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to follow the logistics of that. Maybe just show this plot because it's so cool. And then <laughs> if there aren't any more questions, I guess we can wrap up. Yeah. If there are, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Oh. 
Oh, do you know what might have happened? It's probably the water. We had some really intense rain over the last few weeks, a few times. So um, those seeds are so tiny. Yeah. They probably washed. You don't want to try to move them. Carrots don't take kindly to being moved. So if they're in places where you don't want them, you can get rid of them. Otherwise, just let them be. Um, they need about an inch at least between plants. So they've washed into the so you can try to carefully thin them, good sized carrots. I have to tell you, I think your timing might be a little tough because carrots are kind of slow. Um, so you might end up wanting to put your tomatoes in before your carrots are done. And that can be hard because you need to really dig in the soil a lot, but try it. Oh, do you mind repeating the question? Oh, I'm so sorry. She's asking about a question about some carrots that she planted and it seems like the seeds had washed into where they weren't supposed to be. And also just we were discussing whether the timing of planting carrots and then planting to transplant tomatoes would work. I would say, since you're in the middle of this experiment, go for it. But maybe a future thing I would try is um, radishes or lettuce mix or a mustard mix, something that's a little faster than carrots. Mm, okay. But there's no harm in trying. That's fine. I mean, as long as you plant the tomatoes, you're going to need to dig a fair bit. Um, you heard about the list, lifting of the mask mandate. <laughs> I was listening to Baker's News Conference. Uh, so, um, so it's as long as you can plant the tomatoes um, without, you know, you, you can dig a foot around or something like that. It won't really hurt for them to be close to each other okay. uh, because the carrots are going to come out before the tomato gets too big. Okay. Yeah, of course. Anything else, Emily? Um, I don't see any questions from the chat, uh, but if anyone does have them, feel free to send them now. Um, Yeah. I've heard of different products, but I haven't tried any. Of them. Um, I'm wondering if you could recommend. Them. Yeah. If they are, oh, do you mind repeating? Oh, the yes. First? Um, so a grub issue. And is it a new garden plot? Yeah. Yeah. So they love. They're usually around when there was grass or something beforehand, and they um, are used to feeding oh, on yes, those roots. No, I can't say. I think it was mulch too much. Mm. Um, I just got the one with the so Oh, got you. You to you, but not for um, Okay. So, so dealing with before. grubs can be kind of tricky. If they are Japanese beetle grubs, there's a product called Milky Score yeah. that works. Um, it's it expensive and it takes a little while, but it's. With, with those grubs, it's, with, with Japanese beetles, it's kind of a long game. Like you want to do you want to deal with the grubs with the milky spore. You also want to, when you see the beetles, those little iridescent beetles, you want to kill them, um, <laughs> pick them, you pick them into a container or something, and just do a few different things to help eradicate them. That's probably what it is. That's the most common grub. But any grub is probably a root feeder. So just, you know, getting it out of the garden is good. Chickens are very effective, but not a practical solution in the community garden. Chipmunk eat them too, and I leave them on dishes. So oh, that's interesting. Just don't feed the chipmunks near your garden because then they're going to eat the cherry tomatoes and everything. Just everything. Right. <laughs> and they are—they're so industrious. I have seen chipmunks just harvest an entire gooseberry bush one by one. And I was like, "Are you making wine down in that hole? Like, what are you doing with all those gooseberries?" But yeah, they're very um, hungry little guys. Anything else, Emily? Um, I don't know. So in chat. Okay, so just to let everyone know, um, I will send out a follow up email with, with the plant sale link, the other programs, and a link to this recording, which hopefully will be audible, and a couple resources that I mentioned. So the intensive space and guide, I'm sure I'll find some other things to share with you. Um, so great, thanks for coming. Um, we don't, I don't think we have anything for the next couple of weeks in garden uh, we do have some kids cooking workshops and gardening workshops coming up so if you're interested in checking out any of our upcoming stuff go to the trustees.org slash seed so our workshop series is called seed sow and grow and for anyone who is interested in the trellising question we're going to have a whole trellising workshop on june 2nd at lennox and kendall garden um, which is in lower roxbury so not too far so yeah and it, it will also be screened prefers that. So thanks for coming. Happy gardening. Oh, thank you.
<laughs> Thanks so much, Emily. How, how are your arms? I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, should I? Oh, yeah. Start.